Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Anton Warnchuk in Baltimore, and here to give us a report on the outcome of the European Parliament elections are our two guests. Trevor, Trevor Evans is a professor of monetary theory, monetary policy, and international monetary relations at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. He is also the coordinator of the European Network of Economists for an Alternative Economic Policy in Europe. Also joining us is John Weeks. John Weeks is Professor Emeritus of the University of London and author of the new book, The Economics of the 1%, How Mainstream Economics Serves the Rich, Obscures Reality, and Distorts Policy. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Hi. So Trevor, let's start with you. Uh, do you think that the, uh, that the elections show a prominent rise to the right, that the right is uh, sweeping power within Europe? It's not sweeping power, but the, the two parties of the, of the center, the center left and the center right, have both lost votes. The left has picked up votes in places like Greece, but also in Spain. But there has been this very disturbing increase in the vote of right-wing parties in, in a number of countries. Obviously, France is the most spectacular with the National Front coming in first place, but also and a number of other countries. Denmark, a country that's always been very favorable to the EU, um, a, a right-wing party coming there in first place. In the Netherlands, another country, a small country that's always been very favorable to the EU, the right-wing party there has, has also um, done quite well, although not quite as well as it did at the last elections. So clearly there is very deep uh, concern in Europe about what's happening, above all, what's happening at the economic level. And it has been the right-wing parties that have been able to pick up support with, with large numbers, particularly of working class people, turning to these right-wing parties to express their, their disagreement with what's happening. Now, um, from, from what I understand, though, there was only a 43% uh, electoral outcome, uh, electoral, uh, I'm mean, sorry, sorry, only 43% turnout uh, to the votes uh, for the, uh, the, the parliament. Um, why do you think that was? Well, I think, uh, first let me speak for Britain. I think that uh, there, Britain historically, that uh, and any election except a general election with a low turnout, uh, actually the turnout uh, this time for the uh, European elections was um, about the same as last year. So it, uh, last time sort of didn't fall. That may have been partly because there were some local elections at the same time. But there are some countries, and Trevor would probably know this better than I, where turnout was extremely low. I think in uh, Slovakia, the uh, turnout was extremely low, like 27%. Uh, and when you have low turnouts, it is the right wing, well, it is the more, you might say, fervent groups that tend uh, to make gains. This is in no way to uh, understate or minimize uh, the gains of the far right, which is very, very dangerous, but they certainly took advantage of the low turnout. Now, Trevor, you said that some of the turnout had to do with uh, some of the, the grievances that, that citizens had with the economic policies, but from what I understand, uh, the EU Parliament doesn't actually have any power over monetary policy, um, that, that, all, that most of this power, or any central banking policy, that most of this is still left to the national governments. So um, what kind of influence do we expect to see that uh, the right-wing parties will have over economic policy? Well, I think that the European Union is perceived as being, uh, in important respects, responsible for the sort of economic policies that are being implemented in Europe. That what we've seen over the last few years is that in response to the crisis, policy has been centralized for the for the euro area countries in the European Commission. Policies that in the past would have been decided by national governments are now decided at the Commission. So that we have a whole series of new rules that have been introduced over the last two years in response to the crisis, where national governments now have to submit their, bu their budgets, their annual budgets, to the European Commission for approval. There are new rules that are extremely strict about the level of government deficits, about a whole series of other indicators. And what that means is that to the extent that national governments and national parliaments used to have some control over economic policy, a lot of that has now been taken to the European Commission. It's, it's important to point out, as you just said, 
that the European Parliament does not have control over these issues. So the national parliaments have lost a lot of their influence. The European Parliament has never had influence over economic policy. So a lot is now being decided by the European Commission, civil servants um, who are outside democratic control. And in some ways, this is being played up by national governments. If you are a conservative government in Spain or in France or in other countries, then it's very helpful to be able to put the blame onto the European Commission and say the EU requires us to do this and give the impression that you're not terribly happy with it. So the result is that the very strict austerity policies that have been introduced since 2010, 2011 in Europe are seen very, very much as being the result of, of, of the European Union. And it is seen quite rightly as being largely outside popular democratic control. Yeah, I would follow up on that by uh, adding that um, the rise of authoritarianism, which the far right rep uh, represents, is reinforced by this concentration of power within the uh, European uh, Commission. So <laughs> the ability of citizens, particularly on the, uh, those in uh, uh, Eurozone uh, countries, which is uh, uh, about, is it 18, I think now, that uh, uh, and there are about 10 countries that don't use the Euro, right? Uh, like uh, Britain that still uses the pound. But if you're in the Eurozone, you're very restricted. Your government is very restricted in what it can do. Also, there, there are, we had, Greece has to be mentioned. I mean, Greece has suffered beyond the imagination of uh, most middle class people. You just can't imagine, per capita income now is 35% below what it was uh, in uh, 2010. I mean, reflect on that. This is like a war has occurred. And this is the beating ground for far right fascism. I mean, we should call it what it is. Le Pen is a fascist. The, uh, uh, I think that in Denmark, uh, we have fascism. There are also some fascists in um, um, uh, Poland. So we're looking at a very difficult and dangerous situation. But we've also seen in Greece, for example, the rise of this. I think Syriza won about um, a quarter of, uh, of votes there uh, to enter the parliament. Um, and we've also seen some left-wing parties uh, uh, get, make some significant gains. I think it's in Spain and in Portugal as well. So do, do you see there any possibility for uh, a progressive EU? There's, there's certainly a possibility of it, but at the moment, the electoral strength of the left is confined mainly to the countries that you just mentioned. The, the rise of Syriza is extremely impressive, that we have a, a democratic left force to the left of social democracy that is proposing a quite different solution to the economic crisis from the one which the center conservative and the center social democratic parties have been putting forward. So what we have there is a party that shows there are a quite different set of policies that could get us out of the crisis and not put all the cost on, onto working and middle class people. Um, the rise of the party in Spain, although it's, it's got far fewer votes, 6% of the vote, which is much less, is all the more impressive because it was only formed in January of this year. And clearly people are coming together who want to see a distinctly different and more progressive policy, which won't be based on, on cutting living standards. And I, I think it's very important, as, as John just mentioned, to stress that since uh, we, we now have over 10% unemployment in Europe, it's over 20% in countries like Greece and Spain, youth unemployment is over 50% in countries like Greece and Spain, real wages have fallen in nearly all countries of Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, and some of the Northwestern Europe. And most, most worryingly, there is no indication that things are going to get better. That if we look at the projections from the International Monetary Fund, from the European Commission, from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, all of them see low growth and protracted high unemployment. So in that sense, the outlook in Europe at the moment is very different from that in the United States, where despite all the problems, 
that is uh, growth is picking up and unemployment is, is falling. So um, there has been a growth of, of left-wing groups in a few countries, but the overwhelming bulk of the countries have, have either conservative or in some cases social democratic governments such as France, which pursue identical policies to the conservatives. And there is very little prospect at the moment of the situation changing. And I think that's why we're seeing the sort of reaction we got at the European elections. People, even if they don't know the details of what are, what's going on, have a sense that the outlook is very bleak at the moment. So will these uh, far-right parties that have made some of these electoral gains, will they be challenging any of the, the neoliberal economic policy that has more or less uh, dominated the Eurozone in the past couple of years? Well, let, let me make a couple of points uh, on that. If you take Britain, that is unclear. The, uh, the right-wing party that um, won uh, the European elections here is called the United Kingdom uh, Independence Party called uh, UKIP. It is right wing. It's not clear what its economic uh, uh, policies are. Uh, I, I suspect that they aren't significantly different from uh, the policies of the conservatives, of the, uh, of the Tories. So I suspect they're probably in the austerity uh, uh, consensus. If that is the case, I think that they're unlikely to be a long term threat because if you're going to vote, you as the only real fascist running in the British election uh, was defeated. He was uh, from something called the National Front. And when he said, when he was asked, is, doesn't this show that it rejected the racism of your party? And he said, the racism of our party was rejected in favor of the racism of UKIP. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. And UKIP's racism could well be rejected in favor of the Tory party's uh, um, uh, racism. Now, once you move to the continent, we've got the real thing. In France, that is the real thing. What I mean by that, you have a uh, the Le Pen's National Front is uh, chauvinist. Uh, it is uh, <coughs> uh, it's not uh, liberal in any way. It's not neoliberal. It's not paleoliberal. It is an authoritarian it is a movement with a party with an authoritarian vision uh, for France, which includes racism and chauvinism and all the things that we thought had been defeated in 1945. But it's not exactly clear, I guess, whether or not these uh, these right parties will coalesce into a, a single bloc. I think I, I think I read on, in the Guardian that uh, Le Pen uh, leader the Le Pen's leaders said that they wouldn't be forming a, a bloc with Golden Dawn. Um, so, um, so what do you make of that? What do you make? What, do you think that the, the right wing is going to coalesce into a, a powerful uh, voting bloc, or will it still, or will it remain fragmented? Clear, they're clearly going to remain fragmented. I mean, one, the, the one good thing about the outcome is that these groups are totally riven between themselves, and there are at least at least three groupings, but even that is too simple. There's the far right. There's Golden Dawn and Jakob in, in Hungary. The, these are these are these are semi-fascist groups. Then you have got quite solid grouping with the of right wingers, where the, the key parties are the the National Front in in France and and the the Dutch Party. Um, they they would like to establish links with some of the other more populist right wing parties. But, but they're keeping their distance from, from the National Front. And uh, UKIP in Britain is, doesn't want to be too identified with the National Front. And a number of the other smaller uh, right-wing nationalist parties are keeping their distance from the French National Front and, and, the, and, and the Dutch uh, right-wing party. So there are at least three groupings, and the hostilities between them are, are quite marked. And it's unlikely that they're going to be able to work closely together. Uh, I agree with that. I, I would add a couple of things. One is that it's in the nature it's in the nature of uh, communist and socialist parties to uh, try to cooperate because, in general, they aren't chauvinist. It's in the nature of right wing parties not to because they are chauvinist and they carry on the old hatreds. I mean, for example, uh, uh, the uh, neo-fascists, uh, called fascists, but uh, 
in, uh, in, uh, in Hungary. They want uh, to take back Hungarian territory, which is now uh, you know, part of Romania and has been for 50, 60 years. They want to do a number of things, which would not make them, didn't make them very friendly. Uh, with uh, uh, the, the right-wing parties from uh, their um, uh, of their neighbors, and as for the Golden Dawn, you must remember that Germany occupied Greece for four years during World War II and was extremely brutal. I would think it would be very difficult for the Golden Dawn to warm up too closely to anything uh, uh, German, particularly being so. The perception of the Greek population is that the austerity is driven by the German government. All right, gentlemen, let's get some, uh, some brief final comments from both of you. Trevor, let's start with you. Well, the real problem in Europe is that the outlook is for stagnation and high unemployment. And what people have shown at this election is that uh, they've turned to left-wing groupings in Greece and Spain, but in a number of other countries, they have moved away from the center to more, to more radical right-wing groups, in some cases, um, neo-fascist groups. And it's, it's, it's very important that, that we manage to win wider political support for progressive alternatives. There are alternative proposals for how Europe could get out of the crisis that it's in, but these are not being pushed by these far-right groups. And I think the challenge for progressive parties, progressive economists like John and I, is, is to try and show that, that there is a different way out of the crisis, which will improve the position of employment, which will end the cuts in real wages, and can actually begin to build democracy. And I think one of the key things in Europe is the fact that at the moment it is a profoundly undemocratic structure, that Europe does offer the possibility of getting much greater democratic control over the economy. But the way it's set up at the moment is one where economic decisions are being made by, by, by officials at the European Commission with a very, very weak parliament. We need to strengthen democracy. We need to move forward so that we can have a truly progressive European economic policy, because in my view, it's only at a European level that we have the chance of getting democratic control over the big corporations that dominate the European economy, over the financial markets <clears throat> that set the exchange rates, the interest rates, and so many other key features of the economy. So I think there is a basis for a really progressive policy at a European level where you could do things that are no longer possible at the level of the nation state. But clearly, at the moment, um, that it is, it is the right wing with a move away from Europe and backing out of the Europe that, that has been able to get more publicity. I would, I would just make two um, uh, quick points because Trevor has been uh, uh, very thorough. One is that while these right-wing parties are unlikely to coalesce into a block, or even if they do formally organize a block, they're going to be, uh, it's, uh, going to be a relatively ineffective one. They have a lot of potential to be disruptive, uh, and they have a lot of potential to uh, further discredit uh, the policies of uh, the European Union, and particularly to give the impression that the European Parliament not only is weak, but uh, is uh, a pointless encroachment upon uh, uh, people's uh, rights. The other point I would make is that you might say, why should real news watchers in the United States, uh, why should you care? This is something that's going on far away and so on. Um, I don't want to be apocalyptic, but this is a very serious business. We're talking about the rise of the right. If you're worried about the rise of the Tea Party in the United States, then you should certainly be worried about the rise of uh, chauvinism throughout uh, Europe and through the right-wing parties. And this could lead to a very unstable international situation, particularly if parties of the center begin to tack to the right in order to try to shore up their support. Okay, Trevor, Evren, Tre Trevor Evans from Berlin School of Economics and Law and John Weeks, Professor Emeritus of the University of London. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.